It is 6.30 and uh, I hereby call this meeting of the Region 12 Board of Education um, to order. Uh, I will call the attendance. Um, our secretary is not here. Uh, Joe? Here. John? Here. I am here, Angela? Here. Alex? Here. Justin? Here. Jen? Here. Lisa's not here. Jane? Here. Julie's not here, I don't think. Um, Pete? Here. Mary Weber? I don't think Mary's here. Okay, well, we have a quorum. Uh, at this time, I would like to call on the superintendent for a presentation of the superintendent's proposed budget for 2022-2023. Right, well, I appreciate everyone's time and um, We'll start off with the pleasantries. So good evening and thank you all for tuning in with us to learn about my budget proposal tonight. I appreciate the time of our Board of Education members, our town selectmen, our administrative team, newspaper reporters and community members who have called with vested interest in what tonight's presentation will be. My name is Megan Bennett and I am honored to be the superintendent here in Region 12. I am presenting along with our Director of Finance, Nicole Grant, and our common goal is to provide an overview of next year's budget. Additionally, we have the administrative team present from Region 12 as I share their ideas, the needs they have identified, as well as changes that have been made to their original requests. I am maintaining the same structure that we have come to have for years after years in order for you to be able to track our spending and to follow our story. story we should have the ability to show from inception to where we are today. So with that said, if you will indulge me, I'm going to share my screen and showcase what is our budget for the upcoming school year. So one quick moment. And Showtime. All right, so really let's, let's start with the bottom line because I think that's what everybody wants to know is really what is the impact that we're going to be asking for for our taxpayers to pick up as we go into our next fiscal year. We are seeking a 2.03% over the 2021-2022 budget request that we made to the taxpayers. It should be noted as we go through this presentation that in January 2022, that pricing has jumped 7.5% for inflation rate. I share this with you because it is the fastest inflation that we have seen in over four decades. Region 12 continues to find ways to protect our taxpayers from these increases. We are utilizing contracts, we're utilizing resourcefulness, and we are making certain that we are finding every opportunity to make certain that we are controlling for costs where available without having to impact the educational expectation or the resources we do deliver to our children and staff year after year. The 2.03 increase that we are um, seeking does not capture the total budget request for next year. The total amount it's going to cost Region 12 schools to run next year is $24,810,027. But that is not the ask for our taxpayers. We are able to utilize the tuition in and the agri-science program revenue to offset that total cost to run the district. So therefore, the number of 23,653,375 dollars will be the number that we focus on tonight because that is the number that will be going forward to referendum. This is the number that we are asking our taxpayers to help us so that way we can indeed educate our students to the fullest capacity next year. So we always start with our vision and mission because this is unwavering in region 12. Our vision is a commitment and the promise we make to our community. 
The vision drives our decisions and helps us figure out what investments need to be made so we can innovate and move forward. We educate our children on these principles. As we move into next year, we are going to be focusing on achieving their greatest potential. Next year becomes about maximizing opportunities. We are reintroducing instructional strategies that invite connections and courageous decisions. We continue to recover from the educational impact of this pandemic. The pandemic is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And we're gonna to continue to adjust the education that we have for years to come. But the Chapog Diploma must still carry that same value and worth that it has for the years past. We cannot compromise because we have hit some adversity. So everything that we have done is to reflect the requests, the demands, and quite frankly, the wishes of our communities. So last board meeting, Julie Stewart had shared the feedback from our community forum that happened on January 30th. I thought it was important that our board see exactly what was coming from our communities because we lean into the strengths. We make certain that we continue to provide investment for these strengths. But as we're looking into our budget and we're looking for what needs to happen next, we certainly need to focus on our opportunity and growth points that were shared with our community. We cannot be blind to what is needed in the community and how we need to make certain that our school system answers the call that our community puts forth. So this information that you see before us is going to be used in our long range planning. This long range planning will guide our budgeting for years to come. I want everyone who is participating in our community conversations, everyone who's participating in our forums to know your voices matter. And it will matter when it comes to how we spend, how we invest and how we push our school systems forward. It is with your feedback that we will help create a school system that the Region 12 communities can be proud of. So let's talk about our achievements last year because I want you to know that even what we are requesting above last year, last year came with a lot of successes and that came from your investments. And we wanna make certain that you are indeed educated consumers of your education system, which means that we need to make certain we are held accountable. And that starts with showcasing things that happened that were very positive in our school district. So we have partnered with the University of Pittsburgh and you will hear us talk about the Institute for Learning, IFL, which has driven our um, professional development, how we're approaching our conversations in our classroom and how we're making certain students are accountable for their learning. We wanna make certain that they are socializing all of their intelligence. And that comes from having a K-12 approach to how we have expectations in our classroom, how we expect students to manage their own knowledge and how we expect them to become part of a classroom community. Um, we have introduced more interventionist support through tutors this year. We introduced a math lab at Chipaug Valley School we recognize the deficit in intervention um, that was happening in our schools, especially as we were welcoming back students who may have been learning remotely and making certain that we were meeting students where they are. Let's not forget our top ratings from the US News and World Reports. Last year, we were able to introduce kindergarten readiness camp, that six week camp that prepared our kindergartners to make certain they were ready to move forward. We returned events and our spectators and we have done our exploration of block scheduling. Um, additionally, we were able to get um, our long range planning initiated. Our ban for the $3 million facilities costs that we were doing some um, significant repairs up at Chipog, including our um, addition of the district uh, maintenance garage, um, we're, we're met with favorable ratings. And so we have a 0.3 interest rate for these projects. So as we go to transform those into bonds, we are certainly watching what our markets are doing. We know how volatile the systems are. And this is where it is important that we are indeed completing our projects, making certain that we're showing that our fiscal responsibility is such that we are good 
for continuing to get those good rates uh, going forward. And Nicole will certainly talk more about that when people have questions. Our tuition in option continues to um, exceed what we can um, handle within our schools. So our wait list continues. And as we watch for what's happening next year, we are projecting more growth for this program. Uh, things that we have also done last year that helped us uh, control for costs is utilizing outside contractors, things such as our plowing, plumbing, and electrical. So I know last year when we cut uh, one maintenance worker, we were able to find uh, contractors that could then support our school district to make certain that there wasn't any faltering as we continue to right size our district. And in year three of agri-science, we currently house 112 students, new animal species, and um, the introduction of Bethel students. So talking about the $3 million band that we were band that we were able to secure last year. What you see before you is the list we presented to you last year when we were going into the budget. These were all the projects that Don O'Leary was going to be charged as our director of facilities to make certain we weren't looking for minor fixes. We were looking for long-term um, repairs to our aging schools. So what you see before you is what was promised last year. And what you see now is what we have been able to achieve um, throughout this school year. So there are some things that continue to be um, in progress. We have laid the foundation for the maintenance garage. Our Chapag boiler replacement will be happening. We need to make certain school students are not in the building when that's occurring. Uh, our HVAC controls at the elementary school, lighting and the front stairs, all need to wait for when we have the opportunity because the students are not in the schools. And what you see that is planned um, has either gone to request, we have received quotes, or we have things that are in place and we are just waiting for um, an opportune time to move forward with our plan. But quite frankly, what you see is that everything that we had put on the slide before us is something that we have been able to take action on and it is moving forward. So one of the questions that is asked is, um, how are we able to absorb some of these costs? How is it that our taxpayers are not feeling the full force of inflation? When we know, when we go to the gas station right now, we all have sticker shock. And the way that we've been able to control some of these costs have been things like um, our lease on new copiers. So we have gained more efficiencies and receive newer technology regarding the same costs. We have introduced a system time clock in order to make certain that we are accounting for time, maximizing our personnel and their time on tasks. So this way we don't have to um, have outside people come in to finish jobs that may not have been able to be come to completion finding opportunities uh, for people to cover duties. When we're using a time clock, we have better accountability for our personnel. Um, Nicole did a wonderful job of changing our voice over internet provider, which has resulted in cost savings. Um, additionally, when we recognize we have other fiber lines that can leave between Chapag and central office, um, when we brought to the attention of our current vendor that our pricing could be improved, they improved their pricing with us. So we have been introducing other opportunities or competition in order to help drive down costs and negotiate for better contracts. Other uh, opportunities that we have sought is that as we no longer have um, the uh, contract with CABE services and utilizing the Shipman Goodwin policy, uh, we are no longer paying the $25,000 cost to maintain our policies. We are now doing that in-house with the support of our current legal team. Uh, we have outsourced our food services and we are seeing more students accessing our cafeteria and the services that are provided, as well as finding opportunities in grants, both at the state and federal level, 
So this way we are not dependent on our taxpayers. So that's what we've done. That's a moment of looking backwards. That's to say, we will allow you to keep us accountable because it is important that you know that every dollar that has been given to us in the past is continuing to be utilized to improve our schools. So that means what are we doing to drive us forward? This year, we have sought to balance ourselves. And next year, as we now have our sea legs in this pandemic, we're seeking to find some ways to be a little disruptive, to invite those opportunities, to not just keep it so safe, but to really say, where are we pushing the district forward? So we're gonna start by capturing some opportunities. Um, we have done a lot with our COVID recovery. And part of that means that we have to come back at capturing the distance. Social distancing is great when we're talking about health. It is not great when we're talking about education. Small groups, cooperative learning, those are the things that actually drive education forward. Students cultivating thoughts with one another that had been lost in this pandemic. Additionally, things that we wanna make certain is that we continue to provide those vaccination opportunities. At this time, it is not mandated, but we want people to know that we're supporting these healthier choices. We lean into other mitigation strategies so we can do things that are more educationally sound. Uh, you'll see reach opportunities. We are going to continue with our kindergarten readiness camp this year. Uh, we continue to utilize the ESSER funds to do this, which means that our kindergarten readiness camp comes at no cost for our families for a six week camp for their students and comes at no cost to our taxpayers. We also are going to be shifting in, in our budget to increase more access to full day reach for our students. In the past, we ran two of our classes from nine to two o'clock and one of our classes from nine to 12. We are going to be shifting so all classes have the opportunity to be nine to two o'clock. This will still allow students who are gonna be picked up at the 12 o'clock time to have that, but we do not feel that it is appropriate to leave people on a wait list when we have the capacity to extend the reach time. Additionally, we're going to be looking at repairs and upkeep. We are putting out a request for proposals for architects in order to find out what is the actual cost to repair our three elementary schools. We need to factor in what it's going to take to um, not just constantly put band-aids on some of the long-term repairs that need to happen, but really look at those long range fixes. So this way we can really start um, having true educational potential come out of our three elementary schools. Um, we are going to be leaning into our bulk ordering to make certain that we are finding some of those efficiencies by getting large numbers. Um, when we have everything divided into our three schools, we get pinched for premium cost. So making certain that we're working with neighboring towns, we're working with our rests, we're working even within our own capacities to make certain that we are maximizing um, more volume, sharing those resources, district partnerships. Um, we are going to be continuing some of that enrichment acceleration where we have computer science happening at the elementary school and also making certain that that tutor support and intervention is happening at all levels of education. So as we push for these opportunities, as we're looking for what comes next, we are at the point of continuing to grow our college opportunities within Chipog. And next year we will be inviting uh, a college credit course in horticulture. So we do make certain that our agri-science program continues to provide opportunities that they cannot find at some of the other agri-science centers. Um, so for us, holding AP courses becomes very important for us. Um, we are currently looking at our elementary schools as we are exploring with Dr. DeBrito, uh, Principal Judd, Principal Coella, and, um, and uh, Ms. O'Hara, looking at what are some of the opportunities we can do 
to maximize elementary opportunities. And so these are some of the explorations that we're going through, including a language immersion program that we would love to see introduced at one of the elementary schools. So again, it is not all about the programming that is happening within Chipog. We need to make certain that we are dynamic at every level of education. We are looking at revised math materials, but recognizing that that would have been a, another push on our budget, what we were able to do is we were able to find some federal funding grants that will actually cover the cost of our math materials for next year. So again, capitalizing on some of those opportunities. So where you're gonna see an opportunity, we found a way to get that opportunity without a direct cost to our taxpayers. Chipog has been going through a year long study on our bell schedule. And um, Don Shells will tell you that um, my push for him was that this has to be a cost neutral change. We do believe that there is educational value and having a block type schedule, lengthening our classes, but that cannot come with a cost right now. And so we certainly wanna make certain that we're looking at those opportunities while still having the same cost for our taxpayers for the education that's being provided. And you're gonna hear later on this evening at our next meeting about some of the grading systems that are happening to make certain that we are again, maximizing those educational potentials. So some of the things that will um, be seen within our budget, um, we are looking to update smart boards in all of our elementary schools. Our, our smart boards at elementary schools have hit their end of life cycle. It's important that we continue to utilize the devices well. And we need to make certain that our teachers have access to the devices that they need to provide the education for our students. We are looking to increase funding to the arts. You will see an increase to our drama production. You will see increases in our field trip expenditures. We think that all of those things are important because it's about capturing the opportunities for our students. So whereas we've tightened the belts in the past because we knew that COVID did not allow these opportunities, we wanna make certain we invite them back in. Um, we are looking at Chipog to make certain we are introducing mentorship programs and student leadership. It is important for us to recognize that we have about half of our freshmen who come into Chipog are not native to the Region 12 school district, which means that we need to look at how are we welcoming our students? How are we making certain that all students feel included? And the moment they walk in the door, they have a friend and they have a confidant who can get them some of the answers. Something as simple as how long should I expect to wait in line in the cafeteria? Having another student who can guide them through how to navigate Chipog means we will have less attrition. And I think that it also means that we will start having more student voice and we will have more leadership for our children. We are going to be investing in teacher development. We talked a little bit about the IFL that is something that we should invest in for the long term. We're also looking at how to improve our technological securities. We did an audit this year and we have been doing fixes, but some of those fixes costs come with a price tag and you are going to be seeing that within our budget as we've requested additional dollars for our technology. We are looking for more access points in the building. And also for agri-science, we held off on having a bus um, when we originally proposed the project. And we recognized that the cost to the district in order to maintain that bus would have been substantial. So now finding something that is more like a, a sprinter vehicle seems to be the right opportunity. And I'm very proud to say in waiting, rather than just purchasing blindly, we are finding those opportunities that are right for our agri-science program. So this is for my numbers, people. Alex, this is your moment, my friend. Greg Kava, I'm certain if you wanna get out your calculator, you're gonna already make certain that our math is right on this. But what I want you to say is this is the high level view of our budget. We have provided within your packet tonight, uh, appendix A, B, and C. We wanna make certain you have the information behind 
all of these numbers, but tonight was not for us to dig deep. It was to make certain that you were looking at the generalized spend that we're looking for and how we are controlling for costs, what are our drivers, and quite frankly, as Nicole always does, she breaks down this information for transparency. So in our 100s um, series for personnel, this you're going to see our increase that we saw in our personnel line item is about 3.58%. You will see that our benefits is a big number. We had a substantial amount of claims this year, which is not surprising. I think everyone, as we're starting to see the health of ourselves and our loved ones um, need a little bit more care, we are seeing increases in our benefits. But I have to say, um, controlling for that cost, the original number, uh, had a pretty significant sticker shock. So to bring them down to a 6.05%, I think is a testament to um, our business office working closely with our insurance companies to make certain that we're pushing for finding other opportunities in the event that we need to leverage better pricing. And we have certainly done that here. Uh, we are also, when you look at this benefit line item, what you also see is that HSA contributions have increases, unemployment is up, as well as we have shifted 10 of our paraprofessionals to being benefit eligible. So all of that sits on this line. For our 300 series, um, this is where our cost and why you see a savings here is because of the fact that we shifted over to leases two years ago. And I really appreciate our finance and operations committee as they supported this shift over where now we are having the most up-to-date devices. And yet we are right now seeing that we've leveled costs and controlled with contracts that we've been able to negotiate. So I am proud of that cost savings that exists there. For our 400 series, um, this is where you're going to find our buses. You will also find um, some of the large repairs in order to maintain costs. So it does not surprise us that this hat comes with an increase that we were not able to control for. For the five and 600 series, um, this includes all of our building departments. Um, this is where we've asked our um, our department heads and our um, building principals, if they could control for costs as much as possible. And I have to say, it is with great effort that they come in, take all of the information that they have, making certain that they advocate for their departments and their buildings and to control for the cost without compromising on what they're able to provide for their staff and students coming in at a 2.6% is a credit to our administrative staff. For the 700 property series, this includes our facilities projects. Um, this will need to be addressed. Um, this is where right now we are looking at a drop because of the fact that we have had a number of projects that we have completed. So it's not that we spent more last year and we're gonna maintain that cost year after year. It's the peaks and valleys. And we recognize we did a significant amount of, um, of projects last year. So we wanna make certain that um, we adjust for trying to have some cost savings this year and maybe not do as many projects as we were when we were being very ambitious um, the past two years. And of course, our 800, 900 series, this is where you're going to find our debt services. This is where you find um, our costs for the uh, building projects. And you can see that now it's starting to level off. So we are seeing some of the um, improvements there, but overall you can see the total change and what we're looking for. Overall, it would be a 3.43%. But again, and this is where I'm gonna bring us back to that first slide, but what we are asking for our taxpayers is 2.03%. So 
So our drivers for the budget, um, this is where, as I showed in the uh, high level, I just really wanna make certain that people see there are some things we can't control for. There are uh, the contracts that we negotiated this year. This year we negotiated five contracts. Um, and that's not including some of our non-union members. We also were looking at those employee benefit increases. Some of that is part of our negotiations as well as just trying to make certain that we're controlling for claims. Um, as you can see, our supplies and service increase, uh, we are looking at a 3%. And that question that people are going to ask, did you consider our heating oil and fuel cost? Yes, we did. And what you see there is a 60% increase. And we see a 66% increase in our fuel. We recognize what is happening in the world. We recognize how volatile it is. We are controlling for what we can, but we know that we are absorbing a lot of inflation in that number. But it is one that we certainly factored in. It is part of the math. We know that it may not be everything that we need. So we've certainly worked in different factors to make certain that we've always got our safety net. That does not mean that we hid any money within this budget. It means that we have created opportunities within finding grants, finding on other funding streams in order to help us protect for some of these costs that we know are coming down. And our transportation cost um, was part of our three-year contract with our buses. And in as much as we see a 3% increase, I cannot tell you how valuable our partnership is with All Star Transportation. When people had been fighting for how we were gonna transport, when people couldn't find bus drivers, Region 12 was fortunate enough to have a partnership that continued to provide and service our students. So we do see an increase in cost. That is not something that we, we would um, be looking to negotiate down as that was part of our three-year contract. So when we add the drivers alone, you see, over a million dollars in increases that come against this budget that we're presenting. However, the funding that I am requesting against this referendum is $470,000. Again, we're trying to make certain that we are not pushing the burden onto our taxpayers. So, we do have some personnel changes that we are looking for for next year. And when I say changes, it is changes to the budget proposal from last year. Some of this is just now articulating out changes that have already happened, but now carrying it forward to the new um, budget year. So this year we had approved an accurate science operations manager. This is what we have used because we don't have a director of agri-science. Knowing that we need somebody who is gonna find the synergies within our pathways and figure out the opportunities um, that we need because our administrators, they are wonderful, but we did not have the agricultural background to make some of these decisions and the know-how to make certain that our agri-science program thrives. So we need to make certain we're continuing that forward. Additionally, we will be looking for a 0.6 increase um, at Chippewa Valley School in our English language arts department, and hopefully looking to introduce a philosophy course next year. So um, this would all come under one person's um, uh, uh, course load, but it's certainly an opportunity to expand at Chippewa. And I do think um, as we are growing, our freshman class, we also need to recognize that when students come for agri-science, they don't just take our agri-science classes. They are taking our math, our English, social studies and science, which means we need to make certain we're also controlling for some of those class sizes. We cannot diminish any of the opportunities we provide to our students as we introduce more students to have these opportunities. It is about making certain we have balance in all we are doing. 
There is reduction within our personnel line items. Um, we did reduce one non-union clerical FTE. Um, that was one of the business office clerical positions. We were able to, um, to divide some of the responsibilities and uh, we were able to reduce that position. And also the barn manager position. I made a promise to this board um, when we started three years ago that we were starting the agri-science program, we needed to create Chapog Farm and we needed to create the Chapog agri-science program. And we were not necessarily able to do them both concurrently. And that's where having a barn manager come in to make certain that we were really tending to building Chapog Farm. And now the Chapog agri-science program in its fourth year with our fourth cohort has the capacity to have our students actually execute on that barn manager um, uh, jobs, I don't wanna say um, chores, but quite frankly, to have the opportunities to have them actually experience, to have those lab experiences right at Chapog through the agricultural experiences. And that's where we have shifted over to making certain our students are receiving paid SAE hours for that support. So we were able to dissolve that barn manager position, take those dollars and use them for our students who are now supporting the program because they have the experience and expertise to do so. So we wanna make certain that um, agri-science continues to be accounted for which if you look at our appendixes, appendix B captures the agri-science actuals and Nicole will tell me if I'm wrong in about two seconds. Um, but what we wanna make certain that you are able to do is track the business model that was promised to what has been happening over the past three years. So as we go into this slide before you, what we are going to be looking at is what has happened over the past three years that were not just our projections, that were our actuals, and how that has changed our projections going forward. And what I can say to you is that we underestimated the value of this program. And with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole to talk about our next two slides. Thank you, Megan. Good evening, everyone. So, this is the agri-science business model that we have been updating year to year. Um, we have updated it again with model, this model with actual numbers through this current year. Based on these numbers and our currently issued acceptance letters, we've made minor adjustments to enrollment in years four and five. We did see a decrease in enrollment this year from our previous projection of year three, but our allowance for attrition together with the increase in state tuition from 4,200 to 5,200 kept our financial projections on track. Even with the uncertainty of growing the agri-science program during a pandemic, our model has held and the program will break even next year as previously projected. Total anticipated revenue of 1.529 million exceeds the pro projected program expenses of 1.47 million, which we'll discuss in more detail on the next slide. This results in an accounting surplus of $55,000 for the year, but due to the arrears payment of state tuition revenue, it will not be a cash surplus. In keeping with the practice that we began in the 21-22 budget, some agri-science operating expenses will be netted from the budget request to the town in an amount equal to the anticipated revenue. The revenue credit to support the agri-science operating expenses in this budget is 1.156 million comprised of the state revenue from 21-22 and the sending town revenue of 702,000 for 22-23. We highlight these figures on this slide in blue, and then we adjust it for the 10% attrition. And this brings us to the 1.156 credit against the superintendent's budget. If you can change the slide, Megan. So this is our agri-science by the number slide. It's the format we've used in the past, which segregates the agri-science program expenses from the full operating budget. The revenue figure listed at the top in green is actual anticipated revenue for 2223, which is the current year state grant, which will be paid to us next year in arrears. The 
and the 22-23 sending town tuition, which is paid timely in the year it's expended. When I spoke to the previous slide, I referred to our projected surplus as an accounting surplus. I did this because the state tuition revenue for 22-23, which puts us beyond the break-even point, will be a receivable rather than revenue. This slide demonstrates that the program will remain in a negative cash position due to the arrears payment by the state. And this is relevant because it affects the amount of the credit we're able to issue to our towns that we showed on the previous slide. In this table, years one and two are updated with audited expenses. For the 22-23 year, AgriSign staff costs have increased with the addition of the Director of Operations who began to work with us this year, and also the added funds to support the paid SAE programs for our students. We are now fully staffed in both teaching and support positions. Next year, we'll add our final cohort of students. Adding this final year of students puts upward pressure on program costs for things such as technology, software, textbook, and supplies. However, the major driver in this budget in the increase to program costs is the purchase of the van for transporting small groups of students to program activities. The projected agri-science expenses in the 22-23 budget comprise 5.94% of our overall budget, which is an increase of just 0.29% over this year's overall budget percentage. Year five, the 23-24 year, will be the first year that the arrears payment from the state will stabilize and the program will be at or near cash positive moving forward without the need to qualify state tuition as a receivable. I'll turn it back over to Megan to go over capital facilities requests. One of the things that should be noted, and we continue to use the numbers that are before us at the state. We recognize that right now the state legislation is reviewing a bill in which the state would pick up the cost for both the, their grant amount as well as sending district amount. And that may be a true game changer because what the state is seeking to do is remove any caps on students who may be seeking agricultural education which means that we may see an increase in our agri-science um, students coming into Chapog. So again, we know that that is something that is in the legislator. We are not changing our projections. We continue to work with knowns. We do not want to overpromise, but we wanna make certain that everyone is aware of um, what may be on the horizon for us. Sorry about that. I think no. Um, well, I'm going to just talk through the last slide because it's the slide ended up getting skipped over. There it is. Sorry, my computer I was being a little bit um, funny. But in our capital facilities, as we continue to highlight some of the um, projects that we're doing in order to care for our facilities, we are looking at doing some considerable repairs to the Chapog pool. We recognize that there are um, some cracks that are happening along some of the cement and we want to um, also repair some of the equipment that is starting to age out for our pool. Additionally, and you'll see the biggest uh, cost that we're looking to do is to um, do a parking lot pavement um, repair and actually a total um, asphalt um, paver done at, at, try that again, Washington Primary School. So that does come with a $310,000 cost. And also recognizing that we are looking to have a lawn tractor for maintenance. That would actually be housed at Washington Primary School as now we are trying to make certain we have maintenance at uh, presence at each one of our schools as much as possible but that does mean that we need to have equipment for our maintenance workers so they can service the areas. So region 12 did control for the costs so that way the 2% is not going to um, be the full budget. Um, let me try that again. The 2% 2 is not our entire budget, but that is the request that we are making to our taxpayers. So what becomes important is what does the breakdown look like? And we know that for us, we have 2% against our budget from last year, but our towns and what they feel 
within each town is based on the population of students they have. So we wanna do the breakdown so people know that for next year's membership, Bridgewater has 21.8% of our students, Roxbury has 29.8%, and Washington has 48.3% of the students. This then translates to the amount that they are gonna pay against our budget costs that we're looking for for our taxpayers. So when we look at what does that actually come down to dollars to cents, this is what we are looking at for the cost to each town. And what we do underneath that is we show this is what they paid last year. You see the net difference for each one of our towns. So Bridgewater is up 465,000. Roxbury will see a decrease of 762,000. And Washington will see an increase of 766,000. That is what their total allotment would be. However, we do provide a credit based on our tuition in. So we all know about the um, return that we give to our towns. Once we have gone through our audit, we return money to the towns. And I believe last year it was to the tune of $1.1 million to our towns. Well, we also provide a credit. So they don't see the full um, bill that you see before you. So when we actually look at what we're going to be invoicing the towns, the difference is actually lower. Um, so we will only be asking for 389,000 more for Bridgewater. We will actually see a decrease for Roxbury to the tune of $844,000. And for Washington, um, the increase will be $602,000. So we wanna make certain that we're, um, we're watching and controlling for this information. If anyone wants to know why we're seeing these shifts, Roxbury did see a significant increase last year. And overall, we're seeing a distribution change out because the return to reach program really did um, return us to level us back off. Um, when we did not have as many students in reach, we did not have as many Washington residents. So Washington really didn't feel the increase of um, people coming in from COVID when we lost some of that reach population. And now that we have the return, we really do see the true impact of those who have joined our communities during the time of COVID. So again, the number that we use when we calculate all of this is the $23,653,375. So on behalf of our administration, our staff and our students, I wanna thank our communities of Bridgewater, Roxbury and Washington for the support they gave to our schools and continue to give day in and day out. Um, I've always said during this pandemic that there's no better place to have a pandemic than our three towns. Well, I'm going to say there is no better place to educate children than our three towns. Our towns invest in kids. Our towns make certain that our children thrive. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the support and dedication that has been provided to make certain that we have a story of success. And what we're looking to do is to continue that story of success. Our efforts were seen in US News and World Report ratings, schools of distinction titles, and on the smiles and hearts of our students, colleagues, and families. So I appreciate all of your time and consideration for our budget request and for your support and consideration of increasing next year's budget by 2.03% resulting in our ask for $23,653,375 for the 2022-2023 school year. And with that, Chairman Kava, I conclude my presentation and I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, wow, that was a um, that was a great presentation. Uh, I, I think we we're able to see significant savings from very good economies of scale being done, and that has kept our budget in in you know a range that that uh, is a lot better than what it would have been otherwise. Um, so thank you very much for that. Does anyone have any questions of the superintendent before we 
move on to our regular meeting. John. I have about three questions. Um, should I ask them all up front or one at a time? Well, why don't you do them one at a time? Maybe you'll get two of them answered okay. for the other one. So um, it looks like the driver for the um, 500 series uh, was fuel. And um, the series actually went up $167,790. However, the heating oil for SVS Chipag went from 60,000 to 133,737 dollars, a difference of 73,737 dollars, which would be more than we spent last year, uh, the increase alone. So um, I realized that in the past week, fuel has you know, gone through the roof. But I'm I'm not understanding the you know that kind of a of a change. Additionally, the bus contracted fuel went from sixty nine five to one hundred and fifteen five forty six thousand dollar increase. Um, that's you know like three quarters of the total cost for fuel last year. So. Um, where are those projections coming from the uh, consortium? I was going to say, I, I believe we did have a, um, and Nicole, I know you're going to answer this better than I did, but I know that we had some in reserves that we were able to utilize in the past. And so that was where some of the cost savings have come. And now Nicole has gotten it where we are right sized. But we also realized that we did under budget this year and that we are making certain that we have enough going forward. But Nicole, please, you know, feel free to, to give an answer. Yeah, John, we're working with the Ed Advance Consortium. We were working with three different consortiums, but it has um, turned out the Ed Advance is going to be the best option for us in terms of which consortiums can meet our needs the best. And the it, it, it's difficult to use last year usage, um, especially for the bus, because we didn't run as many transportation routes last year because we didn't have as many activities. So we had um, not as much usage last year as we predict for next year. So that's one of the drivers that's increasing the fuel buses that we plan a full return to activities next year. So the usage is more comparable to our 1819 year than 1920 or 2021 when all those activities um, weren't run. So the buses weren't running. And with regard to the heating oil, um, we've seen a couple of years where we've been in a deficit situation. So the heating oil has had to be not only compensate for um, the prior year deficits, but also the significant increase that it's very difficult for us um, to predict. But those numbers are based on a cost per gallon for heating oil of $2.50 which we're hoping we're going to get because when we made that estimate um, fuel, they were projecting 290 to come down to 250. And now I think that the prices have increased so significantly because of the world events that um, we may be looking at an even higher price. And we do have a call with the consortium on Friday morning at nine. So I can share um, at the next board meeting where that stands after our meeting on Friday. Okay, and while you're there, um... You made a comment about uh, the state tuition grant being quantified state tuition as a receivable. That's for, um, this is the first year we're gonna be able to do that. Can you uh, elaborate on that? So I'm not, quant we're not gonna quantify it in our audited financials as a receivable, but for that conversation, we need to look at it as a receivable in terms of whether or not the program is covering its expenses. So next year, the program will cover its expenses, but part of that revenue will be a receivable because the state pays it in arrears, which has been consistent each year of the program. Yeah. Okay, and the last but, but one- But John, was... I, think, I think what they said was, is that once you get into the position that we're approaching when you have four years of the program, you're no longer having that one year lag because now you're gonna have four years worth of payments coming in in any given year. So that lag where, you know, where we had three years of kids and two years of payments basically right. uh, is, is gonna disappear. Okay, I got it, I got that now. Yeah, that makes sense. 
And the last one is basically for Don, the Washington parking lot uh, repavement. Is that, does that go all the way down to the um, pavilion and including the circle and all the roads? What, 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 is, what is the area that's gonna be paved exactly? So it goes down to the um, end of the existing pavement now where the gravel starts. So the pavilion does have its own gravel parking lot. Um, it does come down along the river from uh, Route 47. Um, and then it does follow the bus route all the way to the end and then circle along the reach area. It does include the rear of the building, the playground area of uh, out behind uh, WP where the cafeteria is. It includes the parking area, both um, next to reach and the central office parking area. It includes a circle and um, it includes the driveway behind the gymnasium to the um, garage under uh, Washington primary also. And John, I did have a conversation with Jim Britton today to say if he had any desire to tag on because that would be the town's responsibility if they wanted to extend it to the pavilion. Mm -hmm. They don't have a desire to do that as they close down they the don't. area for the winter. Mm -hmm. um, but we certainly had that conversation with the town itself. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Pete. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Based on the current inflation rate in the country and the projection for an inflation rate for next year, and I mentioned this to Megan, 2% sounds extremely low. I'm not interested in debating it. I'm just making a comment that I wouldn't want to go back to the taxpayers for more money if there's a mistake somewhere. So I would hope that the business manager and the superintendent and even board members can factor in that there's no way that, that inflation is running at 2% in this country. So I yeah, but Pete, Pete. Yeah. The thing you have to remember is 72% of the budget is personnel and salaries, and that's completely predictable because it's based on contracts that have been negotiated already. So you're really only talking about, and, and you're really only talking about somewhere between 20 and 25% of the budget being subject to inflationary increases, maybe not even that much. And, and therefore it's not quite, 2% does sound low uh, as an increase until you look at the fact that so much of our budget has already been factored in. Um, and, and we don't have inflation impacting it yet. Now we're negotiating a teacher contract next year. Uh, and so the, and so effective the budget after this year, there could be another increase there, uh, probably reasonable to expect. So that's, and that's most of our employees, um, teachers are the largest percentage. Um, I'm sorry, Nicole. So I also just want to point out, it, it's not a 2% increase. It's a 34 Three percent increase. It's just that there's another source of revenue that's offsetting some of that increase. Okay. Uh, Alex. Yeah, I just wanted to relate a story that Nicole told to me. She went to a uh, business meeting up for uh, Western Connecticut, and all the business managers were talking about their increases, and the lowest one was four percent. And when Nicole said that they were going to do 2%, everybody looked at her like she had a third leg. You know, they couldn't believe that we were going to do 2%. Um, and I think it's a, a testament to uh, the staff and what a great job they've done on putting this budget together that we are able to be so low. And I think it is a reasonable number for this year and it, it could go up again next year. But anyway, I thought that was an interesting story that Nicole told me about uh, our 2% versus the rest of the state, Western part of the state. And Alex, I, I thank you for acknowledging the work that is done by the entire administrative team, because it's not just you know one thing, it is thoughtful consideration. It is every one of our administrators working with their staff, making certain that needs are met while still seeking the opportunities to find some cost savings and um, again, we've controlled for costs as much as possible and still making certain we got to say yes on a lot of opportunities. And of course, to add to it, we are fortunate to live in three very well-managed towns that are very that are extremely solvent 
uh, have good tax revenues, and this allows us to have very low borrowing costs, and that just gives us the ability to even weather more more storms. It's not easy, but uh, I think there's a tremendous uh, effort being made all around here on this, uh, and we're very fortunate to live here. Okay. Well, if that's it, there's nothing more. Uh, we will declare this meeting adjourned at 7.30 p.m.